So now I'm going to be talking about um, our refrustration strategy that we are in the process of developing for Florida's coral reef. So just a quick background on Florida. Um, Florida's coral reef is 350 miles long. It borders five different counties. It's managed by federal or state agencies and in parts co-managed by both the federal and state agencies. Um, it's the northernmost extent of shallow coral reef formation, so it experiences extremes that its counterparts in other places do not. Um, and if you flew into Miami or Fort Lauderdale, you're aware that the northern portion of the reef um, runs along shoreline that's uh, inhabited by a huge, huge number of people with development right along the shoreline. Um, and our reef faces a number of threats, but they're not uniform across the reef tract. So restoration in Florida started about 20 years ago. Um, it started with experimentation with saghorn coral, uh, and it has six, six, since expanded widely to include both ocean and land-based nurseries, a wide array of species, and both sexual and larval propagation, and science and techniques are advancing really rapidly. And then at the same time, we had stony coral tissue loss disease, um, and the state and federal agencies uh, put together a, a pretty widespread coral rescue effort um, in which corals were taken from the reef tract and brought into zoos and aquariums to serve as brood stock. And so um, all of this means that we're kind of poised to be doing really, really large scale restoration in Florida. Um, and it felt like the time that we needed to have a plan for that. So we also used, loosely, a manager's guide to coral reef uh, restoration planning and design. And if anyone's interested, there's a couple copies on the back um, table. And we've been working on this for about a year. Um, we started to develop this strategy. Um, and we mainly focused at this scale, which I'll talk about next, on um, the first two steps of the process. So setting goals and uh, prioritizing um, or identifying areas for restoration. So we came up with this tiered planning structure because like I said, the Florida coral reef is so huge and there's different jurisdictions. So at tier one, which is what this statewide strategy is, we're talking about really high level guidance and identification of focal areas to achieve really large scale ecological goals. Then we have tier two, which would be a jurisdiction level plan. And that would include identification of goals specific to, to an individual jurisdiction, further prioritization of focal areas, um, and then maybe likely some guidance on how to achieve those goals. And so at that scale, we're talking about like the upcoming effort, we're gonna um, write a restoration plan for the uh, Kristen Jacobs Coral Reef Ecosystem Conservation Area, which is the Southeast portion, mainland portion of the reefs. And then tier three would be a site specific plan with really detailed information about sites and methods, similar to um, each of the seven reefs identified in Mission Iconic Reefs. So we, um, we asked the reef managers to identify reasons that they thought this tier one strategy was needed. Um, and these are some of the reasons that they came up with. It's not exhaustive, but it's really similar to what Whitney and Leslie have already identified. Um, it's to you know, work together um, more effectively, to leverage and prioritize resources, to get funding, um, and to ensure that effort is focused in areas that are most likely to contribute to the overall recovery of the reef. So at this scale, we came up with um, a vision and goals, and the vision is really closely, closely matches um, NOAA's coral reef conservation programs, and it's to restore the reef to a thriving, diverse, resilient condition that sustains ecosystems and their services for current and future generations. And then for goals, we really wanted to focus on um, ecological goals and at, at a large scale, so things that might be overlooked if you're doing planning at a smaller scale. So we came up with to enhance coral population and community resilience, to enhance habitat quality and support of coral recruitment, and to increase survivorship. And so the idea behind these goals is that the understanding that successful restoration is not putting millions of corals on the reef, but it's providing um, the conditions and supplementing, supplementing populations to the point that they're able to repopulate the reefs themselves. So the second phase of this was um, this focal area identification. We wanted to create a series of maps based on a set of area um, selection criteria using existing data sets uh, to predict where corals might be likely to survive um, and then to prioritize these criteria that matter at a reef-wide scale. So there's lots of criteria that will matter at a smaller scale, but we wanted to look at the ones that 
that really have to be implemented uh, statewide. So we came up with this long list of site selection criteria. They're all great. They will be in the strategy as um, recommendations for future planning efforts. But what we came up with for um, this strategy was that we wanted to look at coral dem demographics and coral larval connectivity modeling. And we picked four species that are widespread across Florida's coral reef. They're already being used in restoration um, and they could potentially be used as, as proxies for um, other species. And so um, we wanted, what we were, what we wanted to, to do with the coral demographics was find sites where um, there are already surviving um, populations that we could be supplementing through restoration. So for our first criteria, the coral demographics, we looked at a size frequency distribution. So we wanted to say in which strata or habitats do we see a good current distribution of both large and small corals with the understanding that if it's supporting sort of small corals and large corals, it's likely been good habitat for a while and may continue to be. Um, and then we also looked at persistence over time. So we looked over the past eight years um, where we're seeing these corals consistently. And that was to get at, especially for the species that are affected by stony coral tissue loss disease, they may not be present at a site now, but they may have been in the recent past. And so that site still may be um, a good candidate for restoration. And then the second layer that we used was coral larval connectivity. This is based on work that will be published soon um, by Samantha King and Joanna Figueroa. I don't know if you are them in the room, but, um, and so that's a biophysical model of larval dispersal. Um, and this, um, it's these 500 by 500 meter grid cells and each one gets a value for um, a, as a source, a sink, self-recruiting or isolated. Um, and so, so to put those together, we eliminated any grid cells, any of those 500 meter by 500 meter grid cells that had very little reef present. And then we mapped the strata by demographic value. So you see here, um, the areas in pink have the, the best demographic values based on that analysis that we did. And then we overlaid the connectivity modeled grid cells with those, um, with the high source values. And we looked for places where good coral demographics overlapped with um, high source values. And so, so we have this map for a proper cornice now. We are working on some, we, well, we are paying for someone to work on some additional larval connectivity modeling. Don't ask me any questions about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I do, I'm not the, the modeler. Um, so we're getting that done for all of this, those four uh, focal species um, and we right now we're basing it on three years worth of the hydrodynamic modeling. We're getting 10 years done. Um, so then the maps will be updated and then the next step is that we would do more detailed planning for um, the ECA as I mentioned. And then I wanted to just include some lessons learned for people that are starting this. Um, so the Manager's Guide to, re to Core Reef Restoration Planning and Design is a really great starting point. It's meant to be used as a guide with modifications. So, um, you know, people should read through it, figure out how, what parts will work for your process and what won't. Well, you heard that from Leslie as well, that they kind of diverted for the second half of their planning. Um, it's really important to figure out what you want your end product to be before you start a planning process. Um, we had. We had a little bit of, we weren't sure what that was gonna look like when we started and that um, made it a little bit difficult in the first couple meetings. Um, I would say be strategic about how and when you engage various stakeholders because like Leslie said, they had a small group so they could engage everyone. In Florida, we have a ton of stakeholders and trying to engage everyone in every meeting was really difficult and we had to kind of scale that back. So just thinking about like which steps do you need um, opinions from which stakeholders and they'll appreciate that too because you're not wasting their time on meetings where you're talking about things that aren't relevant to their work. Um, it's easy to become overwhelmed trying to find a perfect answer when there's lots of unknowns and everybody knows with anything related to coral reefs there will be lots of unknowns. So I would just recommend striving to find a defendable process. So make decisions that you feel like, you know, we've talked about this a lot. We, we, this feels like something that we can take to people and say, this is, we thought about this, this is how we made this decision. It's, we know it's not perfect, but um, we use best available science. And then ensure that implementation is conducted to learn and adapt the restoration process through time. And that's what the 
restoration guide is, or the manager's guide is really good at is making it this iterative process. So if you start implementing restoration and something isn't working, you can kind of go back around the circle and think about why didn't that work and how do we, how do we adjust our plan um, to be more effective. And I want to thank our funders, um, and I just listed there the data and modeling sources um, that we used for this. And I think we'll probably still wait for questions at the end. Thanks. <laughs>